So one thing about, can you turn the volume? It seems a little loud here, but uh, anyway. Um, so one thing about you know, the work I do, we really study teaching and learning, going down to really how the brain functions in this process. And, and so I learn all kinds of, of obscure things, one of which is that if you actually have multiple screens and people are dividing their attention between them and the speaker, they'll learn a little bit less because it puts a little extra load on the brain. So that's why you only get one screen that's close to me. So uh, <laughs> it's all based on research. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk about really, you know, approaching, I'm assuming connected with physics, but uh, more generally, most of the ideas apply to teaching a wide variety of things uh, on, on education and what mo research is really telling us about how to do these things much better than what we've done uh, uh, historically. And a, 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 a focus that I'll keep coming back to is that, and this is really centering the classroom and activities on expertise within the discipline. And throughout my talk, you'll see really what, I, what that means uh, in the process. Now, before I get into that, I want to say a little bit about how I got into this. I, you know, for many years, I taught just the only way I'd seen, stand up, give lectures to people. But I actually was always an experimentalist, and I would sort of sample what my students are learning, and it was pretty clear. They weren't learning a heck of a lot from my beautifully clear uh, you know, lectures, but my colleagues weren't doing any better. And so uh, you know, I thought this was just an inevitable fact of life, kind of like the weather. But I actually came to, to get new insights on this, and so my epiphany came from, work, from looking at my graduate students in my atomic physics research group, where I worked very closely with them and, you know, in small groups, and, uh, and looking at how they developed as physicists. And I came to see over and after enough years, enough students, there's quite a consistent pattern that would show up, which is that these students, they didn't get in my lab unless they'd had 17 years of, you know, A's in all their math and science courses. Uh, but in the lab, that didn't matter very much. They were pretty clueless about how to actually do physics as we, as we wanted them to uh, when they were started out. Um, but after just a couple years working in the lab, they had turned in to expert physicists, thinking like physicists. Uh, and there was one other part to this puzzle, which was I found that the students who were the very best in all their coursework and exams and tests and stuff never turned out to be the best uh, physicists coming out of my group. And so I, after a while, I got so puzzled, I just approached this as a research problem. OK, I've got to figure out what's going on here. And so I started looking into, just like I research any science problem, looking into the research literature on what we knew about how people learn, particularly how they learn physics. And I was fortunate that at that time, uh, physics was kind of ahead of everybody else and really studying, particularly the introductory level, uh, the teaching and learning of physics. And, uh, but so after looking at lots and lots of research, I, I found out basically this wasn't a puzzle at all. It made complete sense. Uh, but it also gave me a completely different way to think about teaching and learning. It got me started in actually doing research in this, in this field uh, where, you know, you're doing controlled, trying different ways of teaching, doing controlled experiments to see what worked and why. Um, and so uh, for many years, actually, for about 20 years, I actually had two parallel research groups, my science education, physics education research group, and my atomic physics research group. And in recent years, I've just been working in the uh, science education part. And so, you know, basically, I'm going to try and give you a very condensed version of what I learned in that process. And it's really uh, basically uh, summarized that, that over the past couple of decades, there's really been uh, 
great new advances and insights in three different areas which we, of research which we now see coming together very cleanly in a nice complementary way to help to guide uh, to, and understand how people learn complex thinking, where I say learning to think like a physicist or for that matter a chemical engineer or other scientist, uh, you know, what's involved in learning to be an expert in those fields. And so, you know, it's cognitive psychologists who are mostly in lab settings study kind of how people think and learn at a basic level. Now modern brain research where you actually can be looking at the brain during learning and after learning processes. And then the work that I'm mostly involved with and, and connecting these two of looking at the science, doing studies in the science and engineering classrooms. Now, if there's anybody here who's from some other field of science and engineering, I'll say that, that we just don't have the classroom data. It's not that it doesn't work, but I think because of the principles come are, are much more general coming out of this area, I, I think one can make very strong arguments it's going to apply to most everything we teach at the university level. Um, okay, so let me start by talking about, you know, what we're trying to teach students to, to learn. Um, and first, at the undergraduate level, you know, the goal in, in physics courses is clearly not to make them all turn into physicists. I mean, you've, you've got, well, what would that be if you did that here? It'd be 4,500 a year or something, new physicists, the world would be overwhelmed. Uh, you know, so although that's a useful, you know, for some fraction of the population that's useful, but for most of them, you know, they're just taking one or two physics courses. Um, it, I'd argue what's really important, and I think most people would agree, that's really helping, having them learn to make uh, better decisions or choices in, in relevant where physics thinking is relevant, okay? And so, you know, that that's something they can go out and, and use later on in many different ways. And learning to make these kind of decisions doesn't mean just learning a bunch of facts and procedures and vocabulary that's too often what they're taught and tested on. It really means something uh, deeper and more important. It really means to learn at least at the rel relevant level, uh, thinking like a physicist. And so I'm first going to talk about uh, more detail what that, what's really involved in that kind of thinking and how it's learned. And I talk about physicists, but it's really experts, academic experts more generally. And so that's kind of the cognitive psychology part. Then I'll show you how applying the principles that come out of here uh, in classrooms and teaching undergraduate science, you can see you get that it works, uh, and what the what the uh, you know some of the data on it. And then, if there's time at the end, I'd say a little bit about institutional change. Uh, so, cognitive psychologists have done lots of studies on expert what makes up how experts think, and so they look across a whole variety of different fields you know, chess players, musicians, historians, scientists, etc. And they find it's kind of very striking. There's very specific aspects that apply to all of these different fields about an expert, how an expert thinks. And there's a very specific process that applies across all these fields about how that expert thinking or expertise is learned, okay? So, okay, what makes up expert thinking? Well, the first one, everybody could guess. Experts have a whole bunch of knowledge about their subject. No surprise there. The others aren't nearly as obvious. Uh, the second is that in every given field, the experts in that field have a, have a very specific way of organizing all of this knowledge that they have. And so, Physicists have a certain way of organizing their knowledge, chemists another way, and so on. Uh, and these organizational structures then allow them to be very efficient and effective in, when faced with a new uh, problem at retrieving and applying the relevant information. Okay, so somebody has to turn off their cell phone because I know the audience is distracted and I certainly am. 
thank you. Uh, I could go into a lecture on split attention and how that really, really damages learning. So anyway, but uh, okay. So these, uh, so what's involved in these organizational structures? Well, physics is actually a particularly clean case because uh, it's sort of cleaner than many of the other fields, but. Uh, but it involves a number of things. But what we talk about is scientific concepts, and particularly in physics, is a way you take a whole bunch of different pieces of information, different experimental results, and you chunk them all together in this nice bucket that we call, you know, conservation of energy. And then there's another bucket that's, you know, symmetry principles and things like that. And so, uh, so the organization is, is, you know, things like scientific concepts. But it also, along with the organization, comes uh, as part of that is the criteria for when that information's useful and when it's or relevant and when it's not. So that's that's a second really important part of expert thinking. And then the third is the ability to to monitor one's sort of own thinking and learning. So an expert can be working away on a problem or learning something and be testing, you know, asking themselves. Uh, you know, do I understand this, or is this a sensible way to be solving this problem? And they can answer that question and either say, yeah, it seems to be going, I should continue here in this direction, or realize, no, nah, this doesn't seem to be working, things aren't going right, I should step back and, and change directions, okay? And so, um, all of, but all of these things are fundamentally new ways of thinking. Nobody has, you know, born with these capabilities, and in, for, particularly for a specific discipline. Uh, and, and what the research shows is that everyone requ requires actually many hours of intense practice to actually develop these thinking capabilities uh, of, of experts, okay? And it's really quite uh, recent that it's becoming clearer and clearer that this limit that everybody's got to put in a whole bunch of intense time roughly comparable time, uh, is, is basically a, a biological requirement that, in fact, the process of doing this intense practice and thinking uh, is changing the brain wiring in quite a substantial way. There's bringing in new neurons, it's hooking up, linking neurons in, in different ways and so on, and it's really within this rewired brain that the expertise, the expert thinking lies. And so, you know, from a teaching point of view, it's sort of a different paradigm. You're not filling up an existing brain, you're really changing what's there. Now, I think a lot of people, a lot of professors, have a lot of trouble believing this. And it's because you've got, your brain has no reference, okay? So you think back and you think, oh yeah, I had the same brain I did, you know, when I was 18 years old and I just learned all this stuff in it. And it's just not the case, because you, you had nothing to compare. You know, if I could give you your 18-year-old brain, you'd see, nah, it's completely different, okay? And we have, a, we have studies where we've seen that we, people learn something and we test them a, a year later. And not only will they say that that uh, no, they don't have, you know, they never had this particular confusion about the subject. Uh, they'll say, no, but they, they're sure nobody could have that confusion about the subject, where we have documented them stating exactly the opposite, you know, earlier. So, so the brain just, you know, it just changes, okay? And, and so, anyway, you've got to sort of think then about teaching is really about exercise and changing the brain. And, and so the research says also that on what's needed to do that process effectively, and it's, there's certain basic steps to it. You've got to have the brain has to be, you know, learner has to be working on challenging, so it's going to be hard, or it doesn't do any good, um, tasks or questions, figure, working on things, and those tasks really have to very explicitly be practicing these kind of expert thinking skills that you want them to develop. And in, a, in addition, it's not enough just to practice them, the right skills, you have to have feedback on how you're doing. And so feedback on what you're doing right, but even more important on feedback on 
what, what aspect of your thinking is wrong and how do you improve it. And so this development of expertise is really just a cycle of doing these things over and over and in the process getting better and better so you're doing harder and harder things. So, you know, it, one it, it sort of takeaway is just to realize that we now understand the brain is very analogous to building up a muscle. You know, if I want to build up this muscle, I, I have to use it strenuously. If I use it just a little weakly for a long time, it doesn't do any good. It's got to really be exerted strenuously, and then it's got to do that over a long period of time, and it's got to be this muscle, and then in response, the body says, okay, he's going to keep making me work that hard. I guess I've got to get bigger and stronger. It does exactly the same thing in the brain, okay? Um, Okay, so this is very general. Let me talk a little more about some of the thinking that's in all of science and, ex and, and engineering, but you can map into your own discipline, uh, that needs to be incorporated in these practice tasks. So first, sort of building on what I said before, uh, you know, every area of science, but specifically physics, has a set of concepts and mental models that are sort of a, a more embodied but also more limited way of, of thinking about the subject there uh, for thinking about the subject and very, sp and very specific selection criteria for when and how to use those, uh, those concepts and models. Uh, they've got pattern you know, recognition systems that, that for looking at a, a new problem to try and decide what information's relevant, what's irrelevant uh, in, the, in the situation I've got. And then anytime you, know, you get an answer, there's very specific ways that physics, physicists have for figuring out, okay, how do I test if this makes sense, you know, and criteria for evaluating my, my answers and conclusion. And finally, um, there's these multiple representations of information. And every actual subfield of physics has, you know, its own specialized representations. And experts then can move fluently between these representations and in the process get new insights and new ways to tackle problems. So, you know, it, I'll, I'll give you 15 seconds to ponder, you know, sort of within your own area, you know, how these play out and and how you would think that uh, what the other one, some of the other things are that doing uh, that you do, not in what you want to teach people, but when you actually are doing, re, you know, your subject, your in your field, what goes into that. Okay, so. If we had more time, I'd have people volunteer and so on. But I'm, I figure, OK, you've thought of different things. I know do pretty fast. Now, OK, now, you know, if, if you've ever been in discussions about education and courses and so on, like I have, virtually, these things virtually never come into the discussion. The, t the discussions, curriculum meetings and faculty meetings, it's all about you know, well, should we teach topic A before we teach topic B, and should we include topic C or not, and so on. It's all about knowledge and, and topics. And the point is that, you know, the, the knowledge is important, but it's really only important, uh, only useful and meaningful if it's integrated in with these other aspects of expert thinking that really tell the person when and how to use that knowledge. And so we have lots of research showing, you know, people can pass all these tests saying they know certain things, but then you give them a real problem and they never realize, they never use that knowledge. It sort of lives off separately from everything else. Uh, so, okay, so that's what the effect that has to be happening in the learner's brain. What's the role of the teacher in all of this? Well, the, you know, the teacher is to make guide this process happening. And so that means, you know, they, designing suitable practice tasks at the right levels for the student, the right level of challenge, that really incorporate this kind of, you know, physicist thinking into the process, providing them with this guiding feedback to improve their thinking, and then 
because it requires you know, strenuous effort, all serious learning is you know, seriously hard work. The brain has to be working hard. It doesn't have to be unple unpleasant, but it's got to be working hard. And so that means that learning really involves a lot of motivation. And so that's the other purpose that an effective teacher has to be thinking, how to motivate people to put in the necessary effort. And so if you think about this, this is exactly what any good athletic coach does in athletics. And so I like to think that the effective, really in a, what the research would say, and a really effective teacher is somebody who's the cognitive equivalent of a good athletic coach uh, in this process. Now, it's also, if you sort of think what would have to go into this, it really requires disciplinary expertise. And in the ways I'm going to show you about teaching, we see it demands much more disciplinary expertise than giving a traditional lecture. And so I, I would argue that, in fact, this is really the only and ultimate uh, justification for research universities like Riverside, where you are saying you're going to bring together people to, who are the best researchers, advancing knowledge in their field, but also put them in charge of teaching undergraduates. And, and this, if it wasn't for this, there'd be, that would not make any sense, but it does because of that. Okay, so before I, I show you how these things are implemented in actual classrooms, I want to say a little bit about uh, what this is not. So, you know, whatever label I'm going to use, you know, research-based teaching, sometimes active learning, or really this cognitive practice with feedback, um, some, sometimes I give this talk and people say, oh, you know, that's just the flipped classroom, or experiential learning, or student-centered learning, and I want to emphasize it's not, okay? These are all, because these are all just kind of formats of, of how you're centering things. They don't say anything about the actual mental activities that are going on in those formats. And so if you look at what people are doing under these labels, Sometimes they can involve the, the, the desired mental practice and feedback that you want. Uh, but, but there's nothing inherent that says they do, and very frequently they don't involve that. And so they, they really are quite different things. Um, and so you know, what I'm talking about is really focusing on the thinking to be learned. And it's, uh, in some ways, it's not at all student-centered because the instructor should be doing a lot. They should be laying out, you know, they're the only ones who know the thinking that needs to be practicing. They need to lay out the activities the students are doing. Uh, and they should be quite involved in the, in the feedback and guiding the students. So, you know, it's, it's one thing to say that you want the students thinking a lot, working a lot. It's another thing to say, oh, I'm just going to make it student-centered and turn everything over to them, which some people do, and, and that doesn't work. Okay, so that's very much not what I'm talking about here. Um, I, I, I will emphasize that uh, one of the things we see is there is a lot of instructor talking to students, but it's quite different in, in the methods I'm going to show. It's quite different from giving a standard lecture because it's, it's talking to them after they've been prepared to learn uh, from that telling. And there's some really nice work by Schwartz and Bransford that shows these enormous differences in what people learn depending on whether they're, they're given certain activities to prepare them to learn from the instructor explanation versus given the instructor explanation and then work through those activities. It sort of makes a factor 10 difference, actually to whether the brain is prepared to learn. Um, OK, so what's an example of how to apply this in a classroom, uh, this thinking with feedback? And so oh, most people think it's easier to do this in a smaller classrooms or find it easier to do. So I'm going to pick a case that's you know like what you live with here and uh, a big universe, public university, of teaching you know introductory physics with 300 students in the room. Uh, and so uh, an example that I've done many times, other people we have lots of data on, for example, let's say I'm, you know, it's sort of second semester electricity and magnet teaching about 
introductory electricity and, and uh, voltage, current and voltage. So it starts out with they're given some pre-class assignment. They have to go read some specific targeted section of the, of the book. And I don't expect them to learn to think about the physics from this. But I, I look at what parts of it, this sort of basic information transfer, you know, the basic description of the phenomena, the terminology, and so on. That's something they can get better from reading a book than they can from me telling it to them. And so move all of that basic information transfer out of class time, saving the valuable class time for more uh, useful things. Uh, and we develop, we study this, develop some techniques uh, to optimize, and we can pretty much guarantee we'll get 80 to 85 percent of the students always doing the, the, this reading preparation now, if you follow the right steps. Um, and so I don't have to start with lecturing them to giving them information in class. I can start with, with question. And so in a big class like this, uh, I would start with this, uh, you know, this question of light bulbs and a circuit here. And they have to decide, we close that switch, what's going to be happen to the brightness of that bulb? And they gotta, they're told they've got to be thinking the answer and be ready to give reasons for their answers. So in, every student has a clicker. And so you know, they push the button that they think is the right answer. And the computer, my computer, records who they were and what answer they chose. Um, now, I see, particularly since I've been at Stanford, a lot of really bad use of clickers and clicker questions. So I want to, so I'm going to have a little aside here to talk about what do clickers and clicker questions really provide uh, for learning, OK? So one thing obvious they provide is I can very quickly, as the instructor, look at what those results coming in are. And I can see, oh, OK. Everybody already knows this. I don't need to spend time on it. Or everybody's completely clueless on this topic, and so I better spend more time than I thought. Okay. So it's quick feedback to me. Um, but from the, the, for the students and the actual learning, what it's really doing is it's having them commit to an answer to which they have some level, admitted, uh, you know, even very low level of accountability. Uh, and, and if you compare, and I could do the experiment here, I could do two things, right? You know, I could ask you to, to say, okay, you know, I'd give you a harder question than that because there's a bunch of physicists, but I'd give you some questions, say, what do you think the answer is? Or I could then, and then I could say, oh, write this, write it down on a piece of paper with your name on it, and I'm going to pick those up at the end of, end of the, the lecture, everybody starts concentrating a whole lot more and thinking about it, OK? This commitment to which you have accountability, you know, psychologically, it makes people vote, think much more intently on it, and it primes them much better for future learning. OK, so the students have answered that way. And then I have them, um, I don't show them what the vote was. I don't tell them what, you know, show them what the answer is. I just have them say, OK, every adjacent three or four students there should, and sometimes I assign them as consensus groups, uh, other times just feel free, need to talk to each other and decide on what the answer is and be prepared for me to call on you to give the, uh, you know, the rationale and justification for your group. And then they, and they re-vote. And so, and while they're doing those discussions, I'm not standing up here waiting for them to finish. I'm running up and down those aisles, listening in on those conversations. And so I'm getting little snapshots of what's, you know, what's going on in those students' brains, how, what they're thinking about. Now, you know, in a 300-student class, obviously I'm not going to sample every group in a class like this. I wouldn't. But I could actually, you know, if I gave you a problem, and I could go up and down the aisles, I can probably capture 80 or 90 percent of what the thinking is, because it's just not that big a range. Um, OK, so then they re-voted as a group. Uh, and then I can demonstrate what actually happened, show them the result, and then have this follow-up summary where I go over and give them feedback on what reasoning was correct, and mo more importantly, uh, what reasoning was incorrect uh, and why it was incorrect. And this is another 
giant mistake that I see done over and over again, which is, you know, you got 40% of the students got the wrong answer, and so the instructor will say, oh boy, a lot of you didn't understand this. Here's what the, here's what the correct answer is, so now you all understand it and go on, okay? And this is what I've learned from my cognitive psychology friends is that doesn't provide almost any learning at all, hardly. What it turns out that you get a little bit of, of learning from being confirmed that your answer was correct. Where you really get learning is when you've got something wrong and you understand through help and feedback, you understand what's wrong about it and how to change it to improve it in the future. And that is really where learning takes place. And so that's why it's so critical to go over, to have questions that bring out incorrect reasoning and go over why that what that reasoning is and why it's incorrect, rather than just give answers. Um, okay, so in this process, how are the students practicing thinking like ph uh, physicists? Well, they've got to look at this new situation, decide what's relevant, what's irrelevant. They've got to have a you know think about what their concept of electric current is and how it relates to light bulbs, and apply and test that concept, uh, those conceptual models, and they've got to then critique um, the reason, their own reasoning and trying to explain and justify it to their fellow students and to evaluate their fellow students' arguments to decide if who's, who's correct and so on. So, you know, yes, this is in introductory physics, but this is exactly what research physicists spend their time doing, if you kind of think about it, or a large fraction of their time doing, and they're trying to figure out new uh, situations and problems. Uh, and while these students are doing this, they're getting this all, uh, very important feedback to improve their thinking in, in real time, targeting specifically. They're getting it from other students at one level. They're getting it by comparing their predictions with what actually happens. And they're getting it from me, the much more informed instructor who can be much more targeted to their thinking. So, um, so, you know, that's basically an illustration of how one does this in a big class. The same principles apply, and I'll show you in, in, in really any size environment in class. Um, I do want to emphasize that just what you do in class isn't enough. There are just not enough hours to change the brain, and so if you really want to do effective learning, you also have to think hard about making good homework problems where they get to spend a number of additional hours outside of class, that, but really still extending, building, practicing the kind of thinking that you, uh, you need them to do. Uh, so I, I just wanted to, to say one little thing here based on my, you know, particularly noticing this in my class I've been teaching just in the last week about, uh, and this is another, uh, another failure, you know, example of poor clicker practice where uh, I've seen a lot at Stanford, they say, oh, I don't want to waste time with students talking to each other. I'm just going to give them the right answer and that'll be more efficient. They might not get confused, you know, they might be confused talking with other students and so on. Uh, and so uh, I wanted to ex show you some data <laughs> showing why that's wrong, okay? so. This is, I, I mean, I'm teaching now introductory quantum mechanics to second year students. Um, and uh, so I'm giving them clicker questions based on material we've covered in class, which I think, you know, if I was a naive lecturer like I was 30 years ago, I would think, oh yeah, all the students know all this. I'm not nearly so naive though. And so, so now I'm testing them on it. But, um, and, uh, but you can see sort of what happens here. So this is just the first individual response to the, to the question. And then after they discuss in groups, this is, the, uh, this is the result. This is the right answer here. So you can see it starts out with actually a minority of the students uh, actually thinking about this correctly. And then just the process of tying in groups has made them learn a lot. And so now three quarters of them have understood this. And keep in mind, you know, you could argue that I had previously explained this material based on what we'd done in class. Uh, and, and so they're learning more from their fellow students. Um, just to show this isn't that unique, I just pulled out three 
uh, several examples just from the past week. This distribution going to this distribution, this distribution going to that distribution, and this distribution going to that distribution, where fortunately, because I've been doing this for a few years, that's always the right answer. Uh, so, uh, but you know, this also, also illustrates some people think, oh, it's just about the, the you know, smartest, best prepared students telling everybody else. But no, these are many, many examples where nobody in the group had the answer correct initially. But through the process of ex talking to each other, they're thinking about it in different ways, they're learning better, and they're actually, uh, well, they're learning something and, and changing their, their views on the subject. Okay, so let me move on to um, looking at the, so these are all the principles, basic implementation ideas. I want to show you, okay, does this really work in real classrooms? What's the data look like? So there's about, uh, I, a few years ago, I started sampling this there's a, and came up with about 1,000 actual uh, re published research studies from across the undergraduate science and engineering uh, where they compared the traditional lecture approach of you know, faculty members standing up, talking all the time, and students sitting there listening, taking notes, uh, with this kind of scientific teaching uh, methods that I'm talking about here. Um, and, and there's a big meta-analysis you can read where they looked at this uh, across a whole bunch of different fields and, and data. And uh, the conclusion from these, these you know, large-scale things is they, is first, they consistently show greater learning, uh, that's scientific teaching, um, with the biggest differences showing up when you're actually testing them on you know, how well they're making decisions or, or thinking like an expert in the subject. That's where the biggest differences show up. Very little difference, maybe you're just you know, learning some procedure uh, to follow in standard way. Um, they have lower failure rates and they benefit all students, but uh, and the data's a little less consistent here, but uh, pretty consistent that they benefit the sort of at-risk students by defini different definitions of at-risk, but ones who've traditionally not done as well in these courses. They, they benefit everybody, but they benefit this group more. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you examples of some of my favorite data from this. Uh, this is the uh, introductory physics, first term physics at Cal Poly. I particularly like this because they, from a research standpoint, it looks at many different sections of different cohorts of students and many different instructors. They have, they teach with lots of instructors of rather small sections, okay? And so, you know, they used, uh, they were looking at how well students could, you know, look at some simple new real world situation and apply the concepts of force and motion covered in this course to make predictions of what's going to happen you know, and see how much it's like a physicist. And so many of you know that in edu physics education research we've developed a bunch of these concept inventories that uh, carefully develop tests that probe for this, uh, this material. So they used that to collect data over a number of years and they came out with I mean, their average was here just about point, slightly below 0.3. We have data from hundreds of introductory physics classrooms now in these kinds of measures. And basically that number is pretty, that's a, a good uh, standard lecture teaching approach number, okay, of 0.3. Then they switched to uh, something they called the studio physics, but that was, wasn't exactly tradition, uh, anyway, what they really had the students doing is, okay, so that their students if are only 40 in a class, so they're working in, in groups of three or four at small tables, working on a set of, you know, problems that they're given to work through, and the instructors walking around acting as a facilitator or coach as they're working through those problems. And so then they go and test the students again using the same uh, test instrument. And basically, the average just doubled here. And in fact, within the statistical uncertainty, all the instructors are doing uh, equally well. And so, 
And this really emphasizes that you have all these different instructors, they got different personalities, you know, all, all kinds of differences, but it doesn't matter. What really matters is just the teaching methods that they're using and using more effective teaching methods results in the students learning much more. And how much more, uh, it, I mean, for this instructor, it's about a factor of six, which is a pretty spectacular difference here. Just taking the same person and saying, no, you know, we're not gonna give you a brain transplant. We're not gonna teach you jokes. We're just gonna have you take this different way of teaching physics and get those kind of improvements. But this is something the research shows over and over again, that it really doesn't matter much about the person. It really matters about what teaching methods they're using. Um, this is another example of that from a different subject, uh, and Beth Simon, somebody who worked with me, uh, and she's in computer science, but she learned about this, this peer instruction, which I illustrated with the electricity example for teaching big physics classes. And she went back to UC San Diego, where she, she works, and got together with the three other instructors, and the four of them teach the core computer, uh, introductory computer science courses. Uh, at, for majors at UC San Diego, and they measured the drop and failure rates, which turns out computer science that's a, is a particularly good area for, for measuring uh, failure rates uh, in a consistent way. And across the board, the failure rates dropped dramatically, and so you, you again have a situation where you've got the same instructors, but they've simply learned better teaching methods, and so now their failure rates are about a a third what they used to be. So this is, you know, a big school like San Diego. This means there's a lot of students who, who are now able to successfully pursue majors in computer science who were not able to previously be just simply because the instructors were less effective teachers. Um, okay, so that research and actually the great majority of research in sort of, uh, undergraduate science education looks at the results over an entire course, you know, and you look at the, the outcomes. Um, and, you know, that's what you really care about. But we were interested from a research standpoint of just looking at the learning that takes place just in the classroom and not so getting away from all the learning that takes place when people are doing homework, studying for exams, and so on. And, you know, there were a couple of reasons for wanting to do this. First is because most faculty concentrate most of their thought and attention on what they do in the classroom. And secondly, there's always this question of uh, people say, oh, you know, that sounds nice, but you can't cover nearly as much material. And so I wanted to, we also wanted a, a direct comparison of covering the right material, assuming you put in place a lot of things we know about sort of optimizing the coverage of this. And so this, this was then, so learning just in the classroom, we had, like here, giant co engineer, you know, uh, introductory physics that all the engineers had to take, multi-sections, and so we could take two of these sections where we had a whole bunch of data on them, a whole bunch of tests we gave them to show they were very much uh, identical in the distribution and, and centers, okay? And so then one of these sections was taught uh, in, by, in the control case with somebody who'd taught this course many times, had good student, very experienced, high student ratings, and then in the experimental course, it was somebody who was a fairly new PhD, so hadn't done that much teaching, but had been trained in these principles and methods of, of scientific teaching that I talked to you about. And so these two instructors then agreed on exactly, you know, the same learning objectives, what material they were going to cover in exactly how much time. This was set up to be just one week of, of classes and carefully timed so that they wouldn't be doing homework and wouldn't be studying exams during this period. And then right at the start of the next class, they were given a pop quiz that they didn't know was coming, so they weren't studying for it, uh, but just jointly prepared that was testing them on this uh, objectives, okay? And so uh, the experimental class design is exactly what you already saw. Uh, 
you know, these pre, not exactly, pre-class readings. Uh, this was a somewhat more advanced course, so it had a lot uh, more calculations and mathematics, and so didn't just have clicker questions. Students also had to, you know, worksheets. Again, big lecture, but you'd sort of divide up all along the rows uh, to, to work through some calculations and, and, and so on, writing things down in worksheets uh, in this. Um, and, okay, and, but the other part, except for that, everything's just the same. Okay, so how, how the two compare? Uh, so this is the, a histogram of the results, number of students versus their score uh, on this common test. And the, the difference, so here's the standard lecture course in red and the experiment course in white. Now, the difference actually is, is bigger than you might realize here because to keep this nice and objective, this is a fairly carefully developed multiple choice test. But so just by you know random guessing, on average, a student could get three. So you sort of have to think that the amount of learning is kind of how far above three the students are. So if you set that measure, you can see how, A, the amount of learning they actually get from a standard lecture is really small. And I, you know, I've actually taken data from lots of lectures, including my own, so this was not really that big a surprise to me. Uh, but, um, uh, but then, you know, the comparison in the experimental course, you can see, is much, much higher here. Now, one of the things I want to emphasize, it's particularly clear here, but we had, shows up in many other studies, is that uh, the entire distribution here has moved up. And so, you know, people often ask, well, maybe this is just better for the stronger students, or more often they say, well, maybe this is just better for the, the weaker students, but it's not so good for the stronger students. And this shows, no, this is better for all the students that have a human brain because this is really the way the human brain learns, okay? And, and that's illustrated by this pattern here. Uh, the other thing we measured, uh, measured a lot of things, you can go read in the paper, but, uh, but the other obvious thing I wanna mention is, is we have some ways of measuring student engagement. And no surprise, here the students are much more engaged because they're having to spend their time, you know, figuring things out, answering problems, or they're listening to an instructor to explain something that they are really primed to want to know about. Um, okay, so, so that work and lots of other research is looking at the introductory courses, because that's where most of the students are in physics. Uh, but some groups, including my own, or particularly my own, have in the recent years have now been looking at more advanced uh, physics courses. Uh, and both at UBC and Stanford, and applying these same uh, designs. And that also I'll show you, it works, it's, I mean, no surprise if you sort of realize it's based on very fundamental principles of learning, no surprise, it works also much, uh, very well in the more advanced courses. And I'll, I'll talk about that. I'm, I'm not gonna go into details here about the implementation, uh, but in this paper, we we went into quite a lot of detail about how to design the course and the activities and actually implementing it in class. And so if you're interested, that's a pretty good guide. Uh, and actually, it doesn't really matter that it's modern optics. You can see how to apply in any uh, advanced physics course. Uh, and so in, in, in this work, we did, of course, want to look at uh, learning outcomes, and so we had a particularly a set of particularly difficult, authentic questions we could put in very similar forms in multiple years on the, on the exa final exams. And so um, those improved. Uh, it's about a full standard deviation between the, the polished lecture class and the, uh, and the sort of you know, practice and feedback class. And an, a second instructor took it over uh, actually, and it's sort of useful here, using many of the same activities and actually got even a, a little bit better results. So it shows that these ideas transfer nicely between faculty. Um, at Stanford, just in the past two years, we've actually converted quite a large fraction of the, of the beyond introductory, you know, ma physics majors course is in the sequence with, with a number of instructors. And, it's all new enough, we don't have a lot, we have some measures of learning, we don't have a lot of them, 
Uh, but we have some other very striking results from these changes. Um, first is the class attendance has gone way up uh, for in, in these courses. Uh, and that's sort of the most immediate thing the instructors are noticing. Um, you know, there are a lot more students coming and they're a lot more engaged in, in, the, in the class material. Uh, they've also found that they covered, since all of these people had lectured the courses before and then converted to this active learning, uh, they're finding they covered as much or more material, actually, than they had before. Um, and in the, we have student, we collected student anonymous feedback on several of these courses. Um, on specifically talking about the teaching methods and comparing them and other, their other courses. And uh, we found that they were overwhelmingly positive. Um, with many of them saying, oh, well, all our physics courses, how come they're not all taught this way? Now, I, I want to talk a little bit about this because I think there's probably some concern here. There's concern lots of places about uh, you know, introducing these ideas, there'll be a lot of student resistance, they'll be unhappy, student evaluations will go down. And, um, and you know, they're clearly not the case here, they all went up. But uh, that wasn't an accident, okay? Uh, and in the work we did, uh, that I, programs I ran at Colorado and UBC, we now have hundreds of courses, hundreds of faculty that have been transformed this way. Uh, and we looked quite carefully at student evaluation because there was this prevailing view that they go down. So we looked a lot at what, you know, what could cause that, what you need to do to address it. And I'll just say it doesn't have to happen. We have, you know, like I said, a couple of hundred where student evaluations didn't change largely. Uh, and, but it's just there are you, you know, there are some things you have to get right. There are some messages you have to get to the students correct. But if you do that, our data says, no, nope, it'll be just fine, okay? Um, and if you go to this, you know, I'll get the end, I'll give you a reference to CWSEI website where we have a lot of guidance for things. And we've got some advice on that particular subject of what we found if faculty do, uh, you'll get student buy-in. Um, Anyway, but yeah, so at Stanford, it's a, been a big, big, the students really like this. Uh, in addition, and, and equally important perhaps, is the faculty really like it. That all of the faculty involved in this have decided they greatly prefer teaching this way compared to lecturing. And in fact, uh, this is a very typical response across the 250 faculty that we've had transform their teaching at Colorado and UBC. Um, where, you know, it takes some time to learn, but once they've learned how to do this, they find it much more rewarding, uh, and they all say they're never going to go back to lecturing, uh, because it's just a, a more, much more rewarding way to, to spend their time teaching. Um, okay, so I'm going to wrap up here uh, with just a, a few quick comments on institutional change, how what's involved in trying to take this instead of doing individual experiments, how to, how to grow it up to across departments and, and universities. Because you know we've got a lot, a lot of data now, and it says, gee, it's a lot better for students for their learning. And we're seeing that the faculty, once they've learned to do it, really prefer it. And so you know, you'd think this should be pretty easy to get Everybody should quickly, uh, you know, adapt and adopt, and uh, you know, we should just teach in a different way. Although, you know, it is useful to keep in mind that it was about 20 or 30 years between the the first completely spectacular demonstration that if doctors in a hospital washed their hands, patients didn't die from infection. You know, it was down by like a factor of 20. And it was 30 years before hospitals actually started having their doctors wash their hands. So I, you know, and their, their failures smell worse than ours do. So I am willing to believe it might take a few years. But uh, OK. But anyway, so, you know, so what should you know, can and should universities and departments do to really have this, uh, develop this? And so I'm, 
we, as I say, we ran this program, we transformed lots of faculty, we transformed, you know, some departments with, with almost all the faculty changed, and some departments, frankly, were very few changed, and there were a lot of lessons learned in that uh, from those differences. And so I got this book that, you know, nobody but an administrator or department chair is gonna wanna read, but uh, I'll leave it to them to go read the details. But I'll just sort of summarize what the top, very clearly the top two issues are that I see is first, um, now, the way I'm talking about teaching here, it's really an area of expertise. And in the same way that, you know, if you want to go do a nuclear physics experiment, you know, there, you've got to understand basic principles of how things work, and you have to know then how to implement those principles in experimental design and so on. Now, uh, and, and this is really much the same way. It doesn't take nearly as much time to, to become uh, a pretty expert teacher, I would say. I, you know, my estimate is about 50 hours, so that's not anything like what you need to physics, but it's non-trivial, and you really, institutions, departments, and need to look at their faculty and appreciate that, nah, you know, you just, teaching just isn't something where you go in and talk about the subject. Like, you know, we know, to, you know, it's, it's moved out of the medieval, you know, folk art to, to something that it's real science and expertise behind doing it right. And so this is just sort of a, a fundamental principle institutions need to start recognizing. Um, and closely connected with this, and even bigger, is then the university incentive system. And it really doesn't capture the teaching practices that people are using and reward them for using better evidence-based uh, research methods. Um, and so, you know, I, I think really the, the essential first step for moving this forward here is that universities have to adopt better ways to evaluate teaching. Uh, and I, there's an article on this you can read that discusses this in a lot of detail, but I would argue that the basic requirements you really want for evaluation of anything, but here teaching, is you really, you know, it's got to measure what leads to the most learning. It's got to be equally valid and, and fair to use in all courses. Um, it's got to show people how to improve and measure if they do make those improvements. And it's practical to use relatively routinely, okay? And if you look at the way teaching is evaluated now here and pretty much every university in the world, what all they do is they ask, they have student course evaluations. And if you look at the, the research on student course evaluations and the results, basically they fail on everything except it's pretty easy to give them out at the end of every course, but they don't, they're very poor at doing any of these other things, okay? And so, um, and so we've developed a, a better way, a, a tool to, to do a, a better job of this which is really a, a, a simple, fairly quick and easy, it takes five or 10 minutes to, to fill out this survey, which really captures in detail what the decisions and teaching, all the teaching methods that it, a, an instructor is using in a course. And then, so first one has a much better idea of what's being done in the course, but then even better, you can then, it tells you the extent of which they're using these practices that research shows contribute to more learning, okay? And so, anyway, that's sort of my push on this. Uh, the other thing I will say for any administrator, well, <laughs> it's important for faculty to, to know too, is that uh, universities are going to have to go to something different from student evaluations, uh, whether they know it or not. And the reason is, is that there have, there's for a long time been sort of some suggestions that there are certain biases in them, but in the past year there have been two really clean, rigorous studies uh, showing there's quite a large gender bias uh, towards the, uh, against the female instructors in science courses. And so basically, you know, for deans who are here, it's gonna be, you know, one year, two years, five years, and somebody's gonna get fired from their job for low course evaluations and they're gonna to go to court as a class action suit and 
universities are going to have to stop using teaching evaluations, student evaluations, because it's because it's such a clear uh, effect. Okay, so uh, you know, I'll just say this: looking at the teaching praxis, you know, based on the research, you know, it's really a proxy for what you really care about, student learning and success, but it's a much better proxy than what we've got right now, and so it's a reasonable approach to go. So to just to, to wrap up here, just about on what I thought was my schedule, uh, um, and leave a bunch of time for questions, particularly uh, lots of implementation issues and so on. Um, to conclude, I mean, I think meaningful, effective science education is something that's you know, really more important now than it's ever been in history before. And it really involves helping students to learn how to think to, to, in such a way they can make better decisions or choices, not just memorizing facts. Uh, and we've got a, this large and growing body of research going from very basic things about how the brain functions and learns up to the classroom that give us a very good new insights and data on how to do this more effectively. Um, and it improves, you know, improves student learning and the faculty like it better. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll, I'll open for questions. Let me just say, I'll make sure my, my slides are available. Uh, somebody will have them and post things if you want to go back. and. Uh, but uh, here's some of my favorite references if you want to learn more about it. These are a couple of of books here on how learning works is sort of applied to teaching at the undergraduate level. Uh, here is sort of something that particularly good if you're a student, this goes into a lot of details about how the brain learns and how you can apply those things in your activities and your classes, even if you can't control the instructor in it to enhance, uh, enhance your, your learning here. And then this CWSEI website, we have a, a lot of resources, things I've sort of alluded to, of you know, usually in one or two page guides to faculty, because we realize they don't have time to read much more than that, on, very, on a lot of specific aspects about implementing these different practices and issues and courses. To, so it's a good reference for that. So thank you. Yeah, okay. Yes, in blue. You only get one at a time until we work our way around. <laughs> Uh, you mean in my graduate students? Yes, I can. Uh, I mean, what I came to learn is that those students, their focus and their learn the the thinking they were learning was not about mastering physics and how to do physics. It, it, if you want to do really well in courses and exams, you you think about how do I master what this instructor is going to ask for and what they want, okay? And I, we, when I go around and I do, I, I do a lot of discussion focus groups with students, and it's really striking how students say, yeah, you know, I really wasn't doing very well, and then I realized I should stop trying to learn the material and try to learn the instructor. And sort of, and you know, and you look at exams and you realize they're awfully idiosyncratic, actually. And so, yeah, so, but anyway, what they were learning was how to give an answer that an instructor is happy with that's very different from figuring out what nature, how nature's functioning. Uh, and so that's why they never turned out to be as good, is that their whole focus of learning was off, and they never really could recover from it after that point. Yeah. First of all, thank you. I mean, this is awesome to talk to you all. It's a lot of pleasure. Uh, you know, coming from the example you gave of the room about learning in the lab, you know, that's yeah. Right. So as a faculty member, how do I get the kind of laboratory type learning of what you're telling us from, you know, is there a place that I can go and train in these techniques to then bring them back to my university? Because, you know, 
resources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, right. So, so that really goes to the institutional, uh, you know, institutional change. Okay, and so. Uh, if you go read my book, you'll see what the institution needs to do to support you in kind of learning about these techniques and how to apply them. There are some resources out there, uh, but there is, I mean, I ran it, I ran, at, at UBC what we did was, in the model we had there, departments competed for money, large amounts of money, uh, which they then used to hire people to be, who became essentially the departmental education slash teaching expert, okay? Most of them actually came in, you know, they, they were pretty new PhDs, they were interested in teaching and learning and, as a career, but they didn't actually, they weren't experts in it. We, you know, I set up a training program that a semester long on the job training program for them and then it continued uh, out for, to, to make them experts. They then worked in their departments to help the faculty all learn. So, I mean, that is one model uh, of, that we used. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, what you're asking me is no, there's not a university of Wyman out there that so, yeah, so, so it's a challenge. Uh, there are, you know, the American uh, Association of Physics Teachers and APT, uh, and APS runs this new faculty workshop that, you know, it's at least a few days of exposing people to these things. Uh, you know, I, we faculty aren't stupid. You can read a bunch of stuff on it, but, but there's a lot of details. Yeah, so, so I, I can't give you a, Quick and easy answer, but you know, it's not impossible. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, my question has to do with the mastery of structured dichotomy and the notion of as it applies to one of the learning criteria, motivation. How do you determine the, the relationship of the intrinsic the extrinsic, extrinsic motivation of the instructor and the student when dealing with content? In other words, Instructor has an intrinsic motivation to deliver information. The student has an extrinsic motivation to receive that information. In order to have the student become an expert in content, you have to kind of culture an internal or in intrinsic motivation in the student. Right, and uh, and uh, and you know, uh, so so let me actually. I think I have a. S do I have my section on motivation? Um, I have a whole bunch of extra slides that cover a bunch of additional things here. Uh, yeah, so let me go down a little bit. Um, yeah, so so just I'll just say briefly something about motivation. Uh, I'll say more broadly, uh, you know, I've been really talking about this part. But there's a bunch of uh, uh, several other things that research says are really important for kind of enabling this to be done uh, well. Some stuff about how the memory works. But there's also, and these are pretty closely linked, the issue of motivation and their, their prior experience and thinking that they bring to it. Uh, these, are the, these are the areas, th this is you know, sort of pretty common. It applies to everybody pretty much equivalently. This is where you have big differences in the backgrounds of, and the background experiences of students. And so the, the issue of motivation now, you have, to, you have to know a lot more about your students, uh, really. And so the, the things that, are, that the research says that are particularly uh, important for generating motivation, I mean, you have grades, but that's not so great. You really want to, you, to do better than that. And so uh, some of the, uh, the, a couple of things that we know are, are really important is thinking about how to make the material uh, relevant and seen as relevant and useful uh, to the piece person learning it, okay? And that gets to the point because, you know, 
that's not the same as what's relevant to you. <laughs> and so that means you really have to know something about your students and what, you know, what their backgrounds are, what their future career plans are, and so, that, and, and so you can show them you know, how this can be useful uh, to them and how it can be interesting to them, whether it's, you know, so they can understand how their cell phone works and so on. But, but so you really have to think about how to tie the material to things at that level. Um, and you also, and I, I always talk, when people are making homework problems, I always push them to say, you know, does it pass the why should anyone care uh, <laughs> you know, threshold? And that means looking at this problem, you know, can you see any reason anybody would care about this answer except a physics instructor who was asking one to one be graded on? Because if you're giving a whole bunch of problems that don't pass, then they go away, and we actually have data on this, they go away with a much more negative view about physics than they started out the course with for, for good reason. So uh, you, know, you can pretty much take any physics problem that's meaningful with a little effort, put it into a context where people can see, oh yeah, I can see why this would solve some problem that somebody would care about. The other, the other aspect that's really important for motivation is giving people some, well, no, there's three things, actually. I left one out. Um, so first, they also have to have a sense that they can master the subject and how to master the subject, and so that they're not saying, oh, I can never learn physics. And so that involves putting structure and feedback in such a way that they see, yes, they really are learning. And so, you know, one of the, one of the ways to really hurt that is to, uh, you know, you make up exams and it's a, you know, a midterm where, you know, you want to sort the students out and so the ideal distribution to many faculty is, you know, sort of 50% average with 25% standard deviation. But, you know, this poor student who's studying, studying, studying the material and they got a, a 70 on it, they don't think about, gee, I'm better than 90% of the students. They think, gosh, I worked really hard on this and I didn't learn 30% of what I was supposed to. I guess I can never learn, you know, I'll never be able to do physics. And so, and so really this idea of really thinking about how to give them feedback to show they really are learning things as they go along and, and how, and many of them come in not knowing how to learn physics. So, so those, are, those are critical, uh, there's two critical elements here. And then the third critical element in motivation that we so see applies very generally is them having some kind of sense of control over the learning process. It doesn't have to be very, you know, and obviously there's a whole lot of things you don't want to give them control over, but if you can find little pieces where you can give them a sense that they're having some choices of maybe between particular topics or in the way things are do, uh, done, even a little bit is actually pre, uh, clearly motivating. Would it be productive to have a pre and post inventory process? Uh, uh, pre and post concept inventory? Uh, so um, it depends on the course. If it's a course where people are bringing a lot of knowledge into it, then yeah, if you want to see if you're being effective, you've got to have a pre and post <laughs> uh, test like that. Uh, once you get past the introductory level, and even by the time you're at E&M, uh, de depending on the students, a lot of times they just they won't know much at all about it. So I developed a concept inventory for introductory quantum mechanics, and it, but it's pointless to give it at the start. And so, but then you can still just give it at the end, and it's you know assume it's zero at the beginning, and and now you can see a big differences in what they're actually learning. And, and so what I tell you about is whether it's a concept inventory, but finding if a department can find some sort of instructor independent measure of learning that you can use routinely, then that's a really valuable thing uh, of actually seeing how effective things are going. Yeah. Uh, oh, come on. We can go more than that. Oh darn, I got my timing risked up. So, shoot. Yeah. I think I can understand why you make um, so much disparaging comments about these debates about what material to include mm -hmm. compared to actually how you teach it. Um, but I, I also wonder if by moving away from a traditional lecture, in a way, you 
we put more at stake in what textbook, for example, is used in the class. If, if you don't have that traditional lecture where you present all of the material in the class. You're, you're making a terribly fundamental, terribly flawed assumption here, which is the students are learning anything from that lecture, okay? So it, as soon as you collect data on what they're taking away from lecture, you realize what a meaningless question that is, to be honest. I mean, you know, go look at the histogram there, right? So how much difference does that really matter? And so, you know, they're always, you really haven't changed the situation any yet. No, you know, no, you've, you've got to think about, uh, you've got to think about designing what things you want them to learn carefully and figure out different ways you're going to have them look, get that material. I mean, in the classes I'm talking about, where they're working through these activities, they're getting, and, and in fact, in these more advanced physics courses, they're getting all the same material, okay? They were in the lecture but they're having to think through it and they're learning it in a much more effective way. So, so it, it hasn't changed that uh, at all. Okay, I'm sorry, I messed up my timing. I expected to have lots more time for questions. My mistake. Thanks a lot, Carl. Okay.